breast lumps. Two words that kind of puts a bit of fear into women, doesn't it? But actually, do you know, the vast majority of breast lumps are not cancerous. So when should you worry? And really importantly, when should you not worry? Well, watch this video where I, Dr. Sophie Newton, a GP, are going to be discussing these issues with Dr. Liz O'Riordan. She is a breast cancer surgeon who herself has had breast cancer twice. We're going to be discussing what different breast lumps there are, when you might want to go to the GP and what might happen when you go to the GP practice, and also when you might be referred. So do watch all the way through to the end. I'm just going to be doing a quick recap of key points and also just telling you a little bit more about Dr. Liz O'Riordan's incredible story. Really important subject to talk, to talk about because you often hear a lot about GPs are awful, they don't know what they're doing, they miss breast cancer, you can't trust them, and it's not the case. And I wanted to talk about what it's like as a GP when you see someone with a breast problem, how do you know what to do? Um, we're not all perfect, we do all miss things. Um, God, that's a lot to cover, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it is true. Um, yeah, obviously, sometimes you do hear stories of women who have had a lump missed or been told that it's nothing to worry about, and then it is something to worry about. But I think that's, I think that's probably rare. I think all GPs take breast lumps incredibly seriously. It's certainly one of the things that we don't mess around. We're gonna get you in. We're gonna, we're gonna check this out. And I'm gonna put my hands up and say, when I went back to work after I'd had breast cancer the first time, it took my hands about three months to tune in to what breast cancer feels like. It's not, it, they can be really hard to feel. And I have missed them myself. I've said, no, that breast is completely normal. I'm an expert. And the radiologists have found something on an ultrasound. So it's not an exact science. But let's start with, when should someone see a GP if they've got a problem with their breast? Well, the answer is actually pretty much straight away. If you're worried, don't don't sit at home worrying about it the sooner you come to us the better because unfortunately some women kind of go well i hope this will just go away maybe it's nothing to worry about and and then you know what we do know is if there's a breast cancer which the vast majority of breast lumps are not then the sooner we can get that that diagnosed and treatment started then the better so certainly just we're always happy you know people say oh i hope i'm not wasting your time you know i've just felt it you know i'm saying of course you're not wasting my time even if i just reassure you then that's fantastic um, and as, as someone who's had a breast lump, that mental anxiety of I found a lump, what could it be? You go online. You, I, the first time I had a breast cyst, I thought I'd be dead in a year. My husband wouldn't want to marry me. It's the end of the world. That mental anxiety. So if you notice a change, just make an appointment. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. And chances are, I know people also struggle sometimes to get hold of the GP and to get in. But a breast lump is certainly one of the ones that you should be seeing quickly. You know, that, and I would say up and down the country, I think GPs are pretty good at getting you in and getting you seen. Um, and then I would just say to women, just have a think about um, in advance of your appointment, um, just some of the questions that we might ask you that you can have a little think in advance about. So we're probably going to ask when your last period was, if you're still having periods. Um, we're going to ask about any family history of breast cancer or if you yourself have had any investigations for any breast problems in the past. Um, so kind of thinking about questions that we might ask that you can have in your mind is helpful yeah. even just thinking about what you're going to wear on the day actually because if you wear like some kind of dress that's really difficult and you know you're gonna to have to sit there in your knickers that's going to be a bit more embarrassing because um we inevitably we will be asking questions and also examining you well, there's always an offer of a chaperone and some gps themselves are, and it might not be just a gp by the way we do have kind of allied professionals like advanced nurse practitioners who you might see um but we will always offer a chaperone and yes yeah, some clinicians prefer for themselves to always have a chaperone, even if the pay, you know. But I always just think, offer. Just to cover me as well. I just think it makes you feel there's nothing weird going on. We're all professional above board, but you will need to strip to your waist. So in the winter, I, I remember, I used to love my little old ladies to come see me, but they'd have their slips and their corsets and their garters and their tights and their undervests, and you're there for hours and hours to so think, yeah. you're gonna need to strip off. One thing I would say, you can get quite angry anxious waiting to be seen because you're worried about what someone might find and you can sweat and you can sweat a lot and as a breast surgeon I'm very used to seeing ladies who have wet sweaty armpits despite using deodorant or talcum powder I know it's embarrassing but we're used to it don't worry about it that's so true especially like you say in summer because we do feel into the armpit um but well, I'm, you know we're wearing gloves so it really doesn't matter at all to me I mean we we see every bodily, you know, <laughs> we're looking at every end. We are not embarrassed. I always say, they go, oh gosh, I'm sorry, I'm sweating. You're absolutely right. 
it doesn't matter one jot to us. Um, we're, you know, so if, in fact, the whole thing isn't embarrassing at all for us. I always say to people like, I know you feel embarrassed. I'm not at all. If that helps you, this is, you know, we try and help people feel comfortable because it's, it's you know, it is an uncomfortable, strange situation, especially when you're worried. So it's, it's always nice to try and make people feel as much at ease as possible. So doing things like saying to them, you know, you get undressed behind the curtain rather than just whilst I'm st- standing here yeah. waiting for you to take your top off. Um, and also just explaining what's going to happen before we even begin that process. So I always say, I'm going to examine you starting with you sat on the edge of the bed and I explain what I'm going to ask them to do and so that nothing's a bit of a surprise. Brilliant. So what changes would you want people to tell you about as a GP? Well, what I guess the most important thing is that women are checking their breasts regularly. Um, because we, there are lumps and bumps in breasts. They're not perfectly smooth and often they can change around period time. So, um, you know, ideally we'd all be checking our breasts at least once a month, maybe more at first. So you get to know what's normal for you. So as soon as anyone's felt anything that's abnormal for them, then that's when we want, we want to know about it. And I'm going to interrupt you now. Do you check your breasts regularly? (gasps) Not once a month. I never did. As a consultant breast surgeon, I thought I'm never going to get breast cancer. I never check them. Yeah. And you've heard from two doctors saying we don't do it regularly, but it's really important. You need to know what's normal for you. And all too often, so the lumpiest bits of your breasts are these, this bits here that goes up towards the armpit. And if this is the lumpy, feel the other side. And often it feels the yeah. same, but you need to know what's normal for you. So hands up, we're both going to do it regularly. So it's a change. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, and well, actually we always start by examining the normal breast, the one that they're not yes. worried about. So we can feel what the normal breast feels like and so that we can tell where there's a change as well. So some people just expect yeah. me just to feel that one yeah. breast. We're ignoring oh. you, the lump is here, but no, we need to know what's normal. So that's really, really important. We go to the normal side first. Yeah, yeah. And we're going to also ask about any nipple discharge, any nipple changes. Um, Sometimes pain, but that can not necessarily be something we worry too much about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so really any changes we want to know about because skin changes, uh, the, the, any, any change that you have noticed, we want to know about and let, let us worry about it rather than you. Exactly. Because it's horrible worrying at home, seeing people on the internet who had this and that and you think, oh my goodness. So let's say you notice a change what makes you think i need to refer this up to a breast cancer clinic and what makes you think no this can go home well uh so we have quite clear guidelines Uh, so so we have um the option of what we call a two-week referral so that is if we even really are considering that it might be a breast cancer i always say to women i have a very low threshold for referring women on for the, to, for the query cancer two week, but we know that most women kind of, I think it's on average about 90% of women who are referred yeah. onto that will not have breast cancer. And that's so even right. if you're referred on, yeah. don't have sleepless nights and worry about it because most likely it isn't breast cancer at all. So that's realistically, that's if a woman over 30 has got a, an unex, a lump that I can't explain what else it is. And like you were saying, when you feel, so when I have felt lump, sometimes I've just known that they're just, they feel different. So often it's with, it's the hardness, the yeah. cragginess. They're asymmetrical. Yeah. They're often tethered to the skin, so the skin changes. Um, so things like that, can, uh, certainly I'm going to be worried immediately. Yeah. And I'm, there's no ifs or buts. I'm going to send that person in. Um, if it's a younger woman, so if she's under 30, and it feels, cause, so you can get lots of lumps, bumps, could be fibrocystic changes or cysts in the breast. Um, and if it feels smooth or if it's kind of mobile, not tethered to the skin, then if they're under 30, then the guidelines are you should see if, they, if it still persists after their next period. So yeah. we might, so some women are a bit surprised and say, I think it's fine. Let's see if it's still there in a month's time, which some women are really anxious about. And I appreciate that. So I try and reassure them as much as possible that this is very unlikely to be anything to worry about. Um, obviously, if they've got, yeah, no, sorry, go on, Sophie. I was just going to say, if they've got like a really strong family history of breast cancer, that kind of thing, then yeah. that will take into account. Yeah. So I used to be told when I was training, lumps in women in their 20s are generally not cancer. And they're often things like fibroadenomas, which we call them breast mice, just a, a little lump mm-hmm. of breast tissue that's kind of grown on top like a marble that you can move around. It is very rare to get breast cancer in your 20s. 
but it can happen. Women in their 40s, it's more likely to be cyst. And again, all these benign harmless lumps are smooth and round and they can feel really firm, like a cyst full of fluid ready to pop. And after a period, they'll often go down. So cysts are kind of increase and decrease in size. That's why we say give it four to six weeks to see. Anyone with a lump in their late 40s, 50s, we kind of assume it's more likely to be a cancer. And that's why it's really hard for GPs because the guidelines say under 20, it is very, very, very unlikely to be a breast cancer. Yeah, and, but then we also have the option of either an urgent referral or yeah. a non-urgent referral. So yeah. even if it doesn't mean that nothing's gonna get happen, it just means you may not be seen within two weeks. It might be kind of six weeks you get yeah. seen or, or and something that, like that. You can be really worried thinking, what if this is a cancer? I can't wait that long. What I wanna come on and say is most cancers are slow growing. It can take months or even years for them to become from a cell to a lump you can feel. In fact, most ER positive breast cancers can take five or even 10 years to develop. So waiting six or eight weeks for a referral should not make any difference in the long term. Just to put people's mind at ease, because it's scary, because every day waiting is like, oh my God, it's growing. And then you feel it and you prod it and it's bruised and it's sore and it's growing in your mind. So they're generally very slow growing. Yeah, I get that a lot actually where women have, have been so nervous about it, they're continually palpating and feeling it. it. Then it gets sore because it's being <laughs> prodded like, and put so Like your mum would say, don't touch it, it's the first thing you do. Yeah, but have you seen? Yeah. And I, a lot of women feel with their fingers digging in. So when we feel as doctors, we feel with the flat of our hands, squishing your breast tissue against your chest wall. But a lot of people will dig in and they're digging in the breast tissue amongst the ribs and it's sore and they're feeling things that aren't there. So again, knowing how to do it yourself is really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so then, so actually the urgent referrals, typically that is for if we're worried about that someone might have a breast abscess yes. or if it's a very severe mastitis. So that's more of the infectious yeah. kind of reason that we would do the urgent referrals because in case they need um, sometimes incision and drainage or yeah. things like that. Uh, and then the non-urgent referrals, really everything else, everything that's, that's yeah. left over. Oh, I didn't mention on the two week as well. So it's the nipple changes in women over 50 is another reason why we go straight for yeah. the, what we call a two week referral. Um, and I think which is quite surprising actually, because if you had a 45 year old with nipples changes, I think I still want to be. <laughs> I would send them anyway. So I think nipples, nipples are weird. You may think your nipples aren't normal, but they can be, they can be five centimeters difference in height. So one can be a lot higher or lower than the other. Yeah, five, so that's normal. Your, your breasts are sisters, not twins. Some women have nipples that stick out for an inch and others have nipples that are always inverted and even never come out when they're aroused. What we want to know is if your nipple has suddenly changed. So one is suddenly in and you really have to push to make it go out. Always a bit of bleeding. But nipple discharge is really common. Do you want to talk to us a bit about what's normal for nipple discharge? So we can try and calm anyone down there who's worrying, thinking, oh my God, could this be cancer? Yeah, it's surprisingly normal, actually, especially when kind of squeezed, if the nipples are being squeezed. And typically it's both breasts. Um, and especially, obviously, in pregnancy or up to a year after you've had a baby, then that's completely normal. Um, if it's only in one breast or if it's bloody yeah. at all, or a bit stinky, smelly, unusual discharge, then we're a bit more worried. But the vast majority of time, it's actually really quite normal. I think that surprises women. They don't expect yeah. that. Um, or if they're getting discharged when they're not even squeezing it, if it's just kind of pouring out. But, yeah. but often, actually, it's to do with something else and not the breast. It's actually a hormonal yeah. problem. So we kind of look at the other things going on. And it seems to be more common in women in their 30s, which is in breast life getting older, whereas you're less likely to have children. Um, smoking can make it worse. And it's a bit like snot. The color of your snot can change depending on where you've been. It can be greeny, browny, creamy. It's the same as your nipple discharge because they're ducts that are open to the air. And it depends on the bacteria in the air and health and wash your clothes as to what color discharge can be. And I've had it and I was grossed out. I was in the shower washing and thought, oh, there's green gun coming from my nipple. That's disgusting. Try and squeeze it all out. Think, oh my God, my husband can't come near me. It's the worst <laughs> thing you can do because Pressing the nipple discharge makes it keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. So if you have it, stop squeezing, leave it alone. It will settle down by itself. I know it's disgusting, and it, but it's completely normal. Just leave it alone. What we worry about, as Sophie said, is bloody nipple discharge or clear nipple discharge. And that can often be a little papilloma, like a little wart in the nipple duct that we'd want to know about. Yeah. Or of course, if it's associated with a lump. That yes, a lump behind the nipple and bloody discharge. You want to know about that. Yeah. Um, what about breast pain? 
because I used to see about 70% of the women I saw in my clinics as a breast cancer surgeon were referred with breast pain. Yeah, this is certainly something we see a lot of and women worry a lot about it. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's not considered among, among kind of from NICE guidance as, as something that's really anything to worry about in terms of breast cancer. So typically breast pain is not something, in fact, a painless lump is more yeah, worrying. Probably. Yeah. Um, and actually breast pain can be coming not just from the breast tissue, but it could be coming from the ribs or something called constrict chondritis or maybe the shingles or maybe it's muscular. So there's all sorts of like a chest wall pain rather than a breast pain. But also women get kind of cyclical breast pain yeah. because we know as we've talked about through the, as the hormones are changing through the periods, then often you get breast pain that actually settles just as your period starts. So if women, I'll say maybe jot a little diary down and again it's about that reassurance and pointing out look it's cyclic, cyclical breast pain yeah it's just yeah. in line with your hormones it isn't really anything to worry about maybe you want to try some warm compresses maybe you want to try some anti-inflammatories yeah. but most of the time it's reassurance especially if there's nothing else exactly. that's worrying us. But if, if it's in both breasts and you'll often get that time in your cycle you say don't come near me or i'll kill you don't touch me don't hug me they're really really sore and some women's breasts go up by a full cup size during the period. They just swell with fluid, cysts get big, and you may need to have a bigger bra for that time when your breasts are really, really sore. Yeah, so a good fitting bra is yeah. really important, isn't it? Yeah. And you may need two bras if your breasts do change size during your cycle. We can go into bra fitting in a minute. I see a lot of women with one-sided breast pain, and I know anecdotally there are people in the media and there are patients out there who said, my only symptom is breast pain. I kind of feel it's a coincidence because most breast cancers do not cause pain unless they are sitting right on the edge of the breast where a bra might sit. But if your breast pain is one-sided, it is almost certainly coming from the muscles of your chest wall and your back. Because the muscles that supply your chest wall and your back also give sensation to the breast. And when I was examining women, what I would often do is get them to lie on their side. I'd have a good prod just there along the rib cage and that would make them go out. And I don't know why women get it. You can have an A cup or a J cup. It's got nothing to do with the size or whether you wear your handbag on that side. We just get it. But it's kind of mentally knowing it's not cancer. You don't need to worry. And you probably need to do a bit of massage and shoulder exercises and make sure your bra fits you. Yeah. Yeah. And often women who are on the contraceptive pill or yeah. starting HRT, that can cause that as well. So again, it's linked to the hormones. But usually it often settles actually once... Like, for example, once you start HRT, it can often settle after a few weeks. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask a bit about family history, because that's, again, you get, the, we had the Angelina Jolie effect. So we were flooded with all these women who saying, my grand had breast cancer, should I be worried? Could I have the gene? You must see an awful lot of that in your clinics as a GP. Yes, especially because what we know is breast cancer is unfortunately so common. You know, it's the most common yeah. breast cancer in the UK. Yeah. Is it one in, sometimes one in seven people say, sometimes one in eight. So, you know, a lot of women are gonna have someone in their family history who's got breast cancer because it's common. So we have to understand that, yes, of course, there are some women we need to be on high alert to, to, yeah. to, to refer on for, for genetic testing. Um, and that's often if they say, we're looking really immediate family, so mums, sisters. Yeah. We might, be, we might ask, we're gonna ask a little bit maybe about, you know, aunts, but really it's, it's the immediate family we're interested in and how old were they um, when they have breast cancer as well and, and or ovarian cancer, yeah. um, because these, these genes are often linked with, with both. Um, but yeah, a lot of, sometimes, yeah, a lot of time people worry and say, oh, my grandma had breast cancer. She was 86. That's not really something that I mean, that's, I'm sorry that your grandma, you know, but it, it doesn't mean that you're going to get breast cancer at, at 24, you know. And as a rough rule of thumb, if you've had a first degree relative, so an aunt, a sister or a mum, and they were diagnosed over the age of 45, you're not at any increased risk at all which is quite young actually, it feels quite young. Um, but that, yeah, so that's kind of reassuring, isn't it? So a lot of the time it's reassurance again about that. Definitely. Mm. What else do we, so let's talk about a bit about kind of breast infections and things, because they're quite common mastitis, the old wives tales about, do you still tell people to put cabbage leaves on the breasts or? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, so, ma so mastitis is either what we call lactational mastitis, so women who are breastfeeding or have been pregnant and um, breastfeeding, um, and then non-lactational mastitis. Um, so the lactational mastitis is often because there's nipple trauma with the breastfeeding and, the, and that gives a, the bugs can get in into the breast, um, or because there's milk that's getting kind of a bit bunged up. So that's why it's a good idea to do the warm compresses and encourage feeding. So some women think, oh gosh, I should stop feeding. 
Um, but if you want to continue breastfeeding, then absolutely do. And in fact, you probably might need to express a bit more yeah. to make sure you're kind of clearing that that um, milk, emptying the breast as much as you can will help. So keep keep feeding, in fact, almost more. Yeah. Um, and usually women don't need antibiotics. Again, they often think it's red, it's, it looks angry, but as long as they are well and they haven't got a temperature, typically we don't need yeah. antibiotics. Um, and then there's non-lactational mastitis, so this tends to be older women. Yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a strong correlation with, with people who smoke. Yeah. And um, so some women, you know, and, and then can, that can lead to a breast abscess. Yeah. Um, so th this is when it becomes hot. There's, there's an area which is hot, painful, red. Yeah. And then they, the person themselves can have a high temperature and feel a bit, a bit rotten. And then you, we do need antibiotics yeah. to treat yeah. that. And if it does turn into an abscess, which is when it becomes like a, fluid filled almost like you can feel like oil that you want to squeeze <laughs> yeah um then that does need that's one of the reasons we would urgently refer in to get to get sorted um and some women we see are more likely to get kind of these um mastitis and infections as well if they've got kind of diabetes or yeah. autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis um but certainly reminding women to try and stop smoking is a, is a good one to try and stop these recurring yeah especially if you get regular abscesses it's really really hard but they just keep coming back and it's kind of because smoking damages the cells that line the ducts so bacteria are more likely to stay you've not got that flow of fluid and that's why like you get recurrent coughs and pneumonias and things but inflammatory breast cancer can be a real sneaky little yeah yeah so that can present quite similarly yeah. can't it but if it's so if the mastitis isn't settling as we would expect yeah. that's so certainly and it's something that we need to make sure. Yeah. So I'm, when, I'm, when I'm saying, right, I'm going to give you the, these antibiotics, but I want you to come back if it's not better. Exactly. We can investigate so that. inflammatory breast cancer is where the breast cancer is in the lymphatic channels of the skin of the breast. So it can make it look red and hot and inflamed, and it can look identical to mastitis. And it's very rare, so we don't see it very often. I would maybe see three or four a year. So GPs are going to see even fewer of it. Yeah. And a lot of women, they say it was missed. And I think when it's something rare that you don't see very often and you're not followed up or someone forgets, it can be really easy to think this is terrible. But I think what you want to say is if you have an infection that's not settling, you see, you need to go back and say it's not settled on the antibiotics. Could it be something else? We always treat yeah. antibiotics first if, you're kind of, if that's what we think it is. But if it's not settling you do need to go back and check because not every GP has that knowledge. They might not see one for a while. It's really hard to keep in your head all these different things that can be going on with the breast, isn't it? I know. And that's the thing actually about being a GP. It's hard. <laughs> we do have to know everything about everything. And so I guess that's the point about sometimes we may not get it right because yeah, as you say, maybe a GP may not, not really know about inflammatory breast cancer or have much experience of it. So, um, but we just, we just it's always doing our best. Yeah. <laughs> Now, this is a question I've got kind of moving off a bit. When I was diagnosed with breast cancer, I didn't know whether I should go back and make an appointment with my GP to tell them. Did I need their help and support or should I just go it alone with a team? Oh, no, no we, we definitely are there for help and support. We, we flag up anyone who has a new diagnosis as soon as we find out. It may be that they tell us or it may be that we hear from the hospital. And then we review them um, usually pretty quickly and check how they are and check that they have got support and aware of who they can reach out to to get help and support and we tend to do that certainly within the first usually quite quickly but then certainly within three months and again at a year and just see how things are going typically we will have contact even more than that um but absolutely so don't because a lot of people say things like oh i don't want to bother you don't that was you they're, they're usually the patients that was me. Who I actually don't waste an appointment yeah. to say that you have got breast cancer just saying hi yeah um they're usually the patients who do need our help more than ever but i always say gosh what would i do i, I need some patients otherwise i haven't got a job <laughs> so um no yeah we we definitely want to be there as a source of ongoing support sometimes often patients do also want a little debrief um you know it's often shocking sometimes if they want to come in with their loved one yeah. maybe they bring the letter and say can you just break down a little bit what does this mean because if you have a relationship with them you might have known the family for years and then had a consultation and they've heard the word cancer and it's well, 
Nothing um, goes in when you leave the hospital. So actually have, yeah. you're having that time with a GP for them to explain it and what's going to happen and I can help with this. I think it's really important. Plus as a breast cancer surgeon, I had no idea how to treat the symptoms of the menopause without HRT because I wasn't taught that at medical school. I'm assuming GPs know. So we're kind of relying on the GPs to do all the bits that we can't do in the clinic. I think it's really important that you do stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, because there's help beyond just the actual breast cancer. I mean, you may need pain help, you may need support, you might need financial help. You know, we've got things like social prescribers who we can yeah. help you. Again, it's it's there's not just the actual GP. We have a team of people. You might yeah. want some physio, you might want an occupational therapist. So there's yeah, there's you a can team of the whole person. Whereas I'm just treating the breast cancer. Yeah. Yeah. So d yeah, definitely don't yeah just sit at home and think you better not bother us. Come and bother us. <laughs> and so many it's amazing how many women aren't taught how to check their breasts and aren't taught what is normal and do worry at home yes um so i think it is up to gps as well to make sure that we are always reminding um women to check their breasts and asking if they would like to be shown how to do it um in the same way that we are always are trying to remind them to ask if they're ready to stop smoking, that kind of thing. Or, so often when someone's coming in and having a smear, it's a good opportunity. Or if there's any discussion about contraception or HRT, yeah. again, it's a good opportunity. So realistically, it is up to us to try and make sure we're encouraging women um, and uh, making sure they know what to do and not to be embarrassed to ask or yeah. for us to show them. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. Um, someone asked a question about what if you you want to have something done privately, you want a mammogram or an MRI inside, or you want to find a private surgeon, you don't like your surgeon. Is that something that GPs can help? Can you help direct people to the right person for them? Or is it potluck who you end up seeing? If someone wants a private referral, we're not allowed to recommend. Are you? That's good to no. know. Because uh, we could be deemed to be, I think it's probably because in case we're getting some sort of payment uh, yeah. from them. But so no, of we, course, yes. Yeah, yeah, so we just say, you find out who you would like referring to, um, then tell us and we can write the letter. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's up to the patient to do that bit of, a bit of research, really. Um, although, to be honest, I mean, I think when it comes to query cancer, I think the NHS is pretty unbeatable. Yeah, I mean, you. certainly locally, our breast clinic is fantastic. And they get women seen and it, it usually dealt with very quickly. So some people ask about paying privately if they've got a breast lump having cancer. I don't think you need to. I don't think it'd be seen and sorted any quicker. I think that's why breast cancer is very different. We don't have a waiting list. I don't have 18 months of women with breast cancer waiting to have surgery. Unlike my husband, who's got a load of gallbladders and hernias on the list. My people I operate on come through the door that week or the week before. So there isn't really a waiting list. And we know that most people we see won't have breast cancer, which is why we're happy to see anybody. I've been sent 16 year olds with um, one week history of breast pain that you know is in breast cancer, but they often need someone to say, it's not, you can stop worrying. Yeah, and that's true. And again, my the breast clinic, um, because we do have quite strict guidelines as to who is supposed to be referred on that. But if I'm worried and they don't mix, don't, they don't tick the quite right criteria, I'm still sending them on. Yeah. I, in fact, like I, I always say, I've got a very low threshold. So if I'm at all worried, I'm afraid you go in. So I always say that at the beginning, so they don't panic yeah. too much when I when I do. And actually, I've never had anything bounce back. They're, yeah. they're always kind of happy to, to see if they, they appreciate that if I'm concert yeah. and that's enough and i think what's really important i used to get a lot of women who didn't realize they'd been sent to a query breast cancer clinic they just thought they'd been sent up because not every gp tells them the clinic they've been referred to that's where a lot of anxiety oh my god why am i seeing you as a cancer clinic yeah well hopefully that's changed i think it has. we have had a lot of uh work on how we have to make sure we're using the word cancer not yeah. shying away from it but in the same sense i'm reassuring women it, uh, you know sometimes I do sometimes like when I have felt the cancer then I am almost breaking bad news yeah. straight away and I don't want them to go away with false hope um and but it's, for the it's often hard to hide your face your reaction when you see something as a medical student you go oh I found a lump don't let the patient see it's often quite hard to kind of mask that and oh, I'm really worried about this and how much do I tell you yeah yeah exactly so when I yeah I remember once a woman and the history wasn't too worrying but as soon as I put my hand on a chest and I felt something that um I was very worried was cancer in it and it was um but I think my tone changed and yeah. so I tried to kind of I didn't want to panic immediately and I didn't kind of want to go Ooh! but I immediately was like okay you can pop your things back on you know my yeah. tone so yeah. that she kind of is aware 
this is I'm going to start saying something now that's a little bit shocking but really the vast, vast majority of cases I'd say I'm not too worried about this but let's just get it checked out to make sure it's not anything to worry about and so that you can be reassured and that's I think that's really really important I think for anyone who's been referred to a breast clinic if you can take someone with you it's almost certainly not breast cancer, but it is horrific. Sat in that waiting room, waiting, you're there for hours because the doctors see you, and then you have a mammogram, you may do, then you may have an ultrasound scan. It is horrible waiting by yourself. So just having someone with you. And I used to tell all my women, bring someone with you when you come back to get the results. Even though I know it's probably not cancer, sat waiting by yourself is horrible. So if yeah. you can find someone just to absorb some of that energy, it can be really, really helpful. Yeah. And that's true when you come to the GP as well, especially yeah. for women who are very anxious about it. You know, some they want to bring someone, and that's fine. Um, who can sit on the behind the curtain, you know, sit on the other side of the curtain. But um, so that's absolutely fine mm. as well. Maybe reassuring. Brilliant. So I think our take-home message would be: What would you say to anyone out there? If you're not doing it already, make sure you are examining your own breasts getting to know what's normal for you so that as soon as you feel anything abnormal, don't try and worry about it by yourself. Do get checked out straight away. And the vast majority of the time we'll be able to reassure you. We may send you on for some further to the breast plate to get some further imaging. Um, but we know that breast lumps are really common. And although breast cancer is common, the vast majority of breast lumps are not cancer. So just to get checked out, but don't panic. I think that's probably the key thing. Yeah, no, I'd agree with you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Sophie. We'll have to do this again. If you've got questions yeah. you want to ask Sophie, the GP, about breast health or anything else, let us know. And thank you all for watching today. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hope you enjoyed that and found it really insightful and helpful. So I think my key takeaway after watching it back is that even though I am a medic and I show women how to examine their own breasts and I remind them about how important it is, I admit in that video that I don't do it as often as I should. And that's going to change. And it's going to change now. I'm going to start doing it at least once a month. And I hope you are too, because that's the most important thing. Because once we know what our breasts feel like, we know what's normal, we know what's abnormal. And then when that happens, we can get checked out. Don't wait, don't worry about it too much, but get checked out soon. And if you're referred, just remember that the vast majority of lumps are not breast cancer. But obviously some of them unfortunately are, so we just need to be alert to that too. And then I also just wanted to give you a bit more information about uh, Dr. Liz O'Riordan, who is remarkable. Um, so as I mentioned at the beginning, she was a breast cancer surgeon and at age 40, she found out she had breast cancer. Um, she then discovered a few years later that she had a recurrence of breast cancer on the chest wall and she had to have further treatment. But while she was having treatment, she was even doing triathlons and half Ironman. Um, so she was this incredible powerhouse of a woman who, who didn't ever stop. And she um, is now an ambassador for a charity called Working With Cancer that helps people get back to work um, through their cancer treatment and following their treatment. She's already written one book and she's got another book coming out. She's done TED Talks. She's on all kinds of social media. Um, so I'm going to put links to all this and her website uh, in the description. So please do take a look. And although she wasn't able to go back to um, her career she loved as working as a breast cancer surgeon, she was only able to help one woman at a time when she was doing that. And now through everything she's doing, she's helping thousands of women. So it was a real honour to be able to um, share this video um, with her and I hope you found it really helpful. Do subscribe to my channel and have a look at um, lots of my other videos which you may also find helpful.